This lecture is on proximal humerus fractures, principles of diagnosis, decision making, and treatment. I'm Saqib Rahman. I am narrating and going to go through these slides prepared by Dr. Finkmeyer, and this is part of the Orthopedic Trauma Association uh, Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version 3. So the objectives are to learn the principles of diagnosis, learn the principles of decision making, and learn the various treatment options. So as a point of epidemiology, th these are common fractures, right? In the upper extremity, they're the second most common fracture we see. Uh, in elderly patients, it's one of the most common fractures overall um, after uh, hip fractures and distal radius fractures. And in fact, when a, an elderly patient gets this fracture and don't know that they have osteoporosis, you have to inform them that they probably do have osteoporosis and they should be worked up for this and uh, potentially treated uh, to prevent future uh, hip fractures. Yeah, distal radius fractures are kind of another another fracture uh, that um, can alert you to this fact as well. So let's get into a little bit of anatomy. Uh, there are four anatomic parts and I'll talk a little bit more about parts uh, later when we talk about classification but um, these are the uh, greater tuberosity, the humeral head, the lesser tuberosity, and the surgical neck and shaft. So the um, greater tuber, and, and these all have, not all, but there, there are some deforming forces here we should understand. So the greater tuberosity, of course, has um, the supra-infraspinatus inserted, and this, therefore, will have a tendency to sometimes migrate proximally or sometimes posteriorly, whereas the lesser tuberosity has the potential to migrate medially. Uh, the humeral head unfortunately does not have any uh, tendon attachment and uh, is at risk for osteonecrosis due to its blood supply if, if that fracture is displaced. And then you have the uh, shaft and the shaft uh, has deltoid and pectoralis um, insertion and it's certainly with that pectoralis uh, insertion here uh, there's a tendency for the shaft fragment to um, to slide medially um, with respect to the uh, the other fragments in the proximal humerus. You may see that sometimes. So vascular supply. The um, anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries are branches off of the axillary artery and uh, they provide um, blood supply to the humeral head. And there is some, some blood supply that comes uh, from superiorly as shown here as well. Uh, but uh, but this is the um, the main artery that unfortunately can get disrupted, uh, which could lead to osteonecrosis. Now, the clinical significance of osteonecrosis in the humeral head is uh, felt by many not to be as devastating as osteonecrosis in the uh, femoral head, for instance. But still, it's you should be aware of what can lead to this. Um, here's some uh, data from a study I'm not going to go through. Um, as I mentioned, the arcuate artery is the vessel that is generally interrupted. Um, and even when that happens, some recent data has shown that perfusion from those posterior circumflex vessels alone could be adequate for head survival. So just because you have the arcuate artery disrupted doesn't necessarily mean that the head's going to die. So a few words about x-rays. Um, Standard views are your true AP, transcapular Y, and um, an axillary view. So remember, true AP, it, you know, it's it's also known as if your tech doesn't know what you're talking about. And this is not a typical standard view. You know, standard view is kind of they, they shoot an AP of the shoulder, uh, uh, which is essentially an AP of the chest, but centered on the shoulder. Uh, to get this view, the true AP, you have to angle the patient such that you are taking into account um, the uh, version of the uh, glenoid. And what you should see, and this is a non-fractured, non-dislocated shoulder, but you want to see this joint space here. Okay, and this is very important. And if you don't get this, you could potentially miss um, like a posterior shoulder dislocation, for instance. Transcapular Y view is shown here. So this is that sort of you know why and uh, again you're looking to see uh, relative position of the humerus to the um, scapula and then the axillary view um, it's an awkward view to get in the injured patient as you can imagine uh, trying to position the arm like this the, the, the 
beam can be shot this way or in the other direction down this way. Uh, it's a nice view to look at the tuberosities. Okay, you can imagine here's a lesser tuberosity. The greater tuberosity, for instance, is if it's displaced posteriorly, you may see it sitting out here on the axillary view, and that may be harder to see on the other views. But it's a hard x-ray to get. Um, CT scan, I think, is really helpful for a lot of reasons, and I think nobody will dispute that it's helpful to look at the articular surface. So if you have a head-splitting injury, on plain films you may see a double arcuate sign, but uh, you want a CT scan if you can get one to really confirm that and uh, better identify that. Uh, I think it's it's nice to show tuberosity displacement, especially the uh, lesser tuberosity like shown here. Um, the uh, And I think that uh, overall for um, better understanding a fracture that is honestly I think pretty hard to to, to, to accurately characterize on plane films many times. I think CT scans can be helpful, and this, I think th even three-dimensional recons um, can be helpful uh, for operative, uh, preoperative planning. So most proximal humerus fractures are non-displaced and can be treated non-operatively. Um, and out of the ones that are displaced, uh, you do have to take some things into account to decide um, whether you need to operate on them. Uh, and, like many fractures, you're going to look at fracture pattern. In the shoulder, you're going to look at uh, factors that uh, make you concerned or less concerned about head viability, bone quality, um, implant limitations, and that's something we've improved, uh, certainly with locked plates, and patient age and comorbidities. So a couple more words about uh, classification. So here are those parts again, all right? And we, we went through them again, and here on the left you can see you know, really old looking slide, and this is a slide you'll see in all the textbooks kind of demonstrating all the parts. I have to say, I think that, well, let's just first state, uh, state the definition. So to be a part, I put that in quotes, uh, a near part, all right, so this is the near classification. So to be a part, you have to be displaced more than one centimeter or 45 degrees angulated, okay? So, uh, a surgical neck fracture that's non-displaced would be considered, um, for instance, a uh, one-part fracture, okay, um, because it's minimally displaced. Whereas if it's more displaced or angulated, then it becomes, you know, for instance, here this would be considered a two-part surgical neck fracture. So this was the near classification. Personally, I have to say, I don't think it's particularly. Um, I don't think it's that helpful, let's just say. I mean, I think there are other classifications that are a little bit more helpful. Uh, and I think it's to some degree because plain radiographs are really hard to interpret uh, uh, how exactly how displaced a fragment is because of all the deforming forces, rotation, fragments going posteriorly and superiorly, and you know, in their impaction taking place that sometimes is, is not well seen because you're dealing with the chest wall and getting orthogonal views is often difficult. Um, and every time you just move for a different view, that those numbers change. You know, so what looks like five millimeters on one view, you just change the arm to get an axillary view, now it looks completely different. I mean, what do you go with, right? So, I, I, and the inner observer reliability for this is terrible. And, and it's widely used, but I think we look at these numbers and uh, unfortunately um, I think that the imaging we use to come up with these numbers uh, is just is unfortunately it's antiquated and um, in the shoulder I think it's um, it's you know again plain radiographs are what we use uh, you should be aware of the classification um, another classification is AO classification we'll, we'll use this a little bit more as we go through this talk but I have to say um, uh, I, this is not a classification that you hear used very much at all. Um, uh, whereas I think AO classification seems, at least to me, to be very useful in the distal humerus, even in the distal radius, distal femur, proximal tibia, distal tibia. I mean, there's so many places where it is useful uh, for periarticular fractures. Uh, proximal humerus, I, I, I can tell you that in conversations with orthopedic surgeons, you talk about cases communicating, this is not... This is not a place where you hear somebody, you know, describe their proximal humerus fracture using AO classification. So, sorry, but um, let's go through it. So th these are the these are the um, 
uh, type A, type B, and type C. So type A would be um, extra articular in the AO classification. Type B would be partial articular. Uh, and you can see, um, you know, it doesn't quite fit the bill, but I mean, that with the proximal humerus, that's what you have to deal with. And then type C typically is considered the complete articular, and that's actually like a four-part plus anatomic neck. Okay, it just doesn't quite fit the common fracture patterns that you see either. A um, couple of words about predictors of ischemia. Um, this is important, the loss of integrity of that medial hinge. Um, and we'll see this in some cases that we're going to get to. And the um, uh, fracture pattern. So if you have an anatomic neck fracture, that can um, be highly predictive for, um, for ischemia. So a couple of things you'll see when we get through, when we go through some of the cases, but those are some, some key um, concepts to, to keep in mind. So, you know, uh, lateral displacement of the femoral head, and, and I would say, um, uh, in, in my opinion, I think the head here is sitting right where it should with respect to the glenoid. You know, it's, it's the shaft, which is translated medially and being pulled by the pectoralis. But unfortunately, when you get that type of uh, displacement, um, then sometimes that can indicate the uh, that medial hinge being displaced and the head may not be viable, as opposed to this case. And again, I think when you have these complex fractures, um, trying to measure a couple of millimeters this way or the other, uh, depending on how the patient's rotated and all these fracture fragments are superimposed on each other, um, uh, I, I think is uh, uh, involves a little bit of guesswork. So one of the things I also said you need to take into account to decide um, if you have to fix something or how you might have to fix something is bone quality. So um, uh, a, a cortical thickness of less than four millimeters has been suggested to be indicative of low bone mineral density. And um, so I think that's something you have to take into account as well. And implant limitations. You know, in this day and age, we just don't use that anymore. Okay, that's an old school clover leaf type small fragment implant. You just you don't use that. There's no reason to use. That. I mean, I think in a, in a lot of other, you know, in the fractures of the distal radius, distal humerus. I mean, just about everywhere else. I mean, there are plenty of indications for non-locked plates. Um, uh, for uh like a, you know, what the equivalent of would be a surgical neck fracture. Usually not the case in the proximal humerus, okay? Uh, clearly not the case in osteoporotic patients, but I would even argue in younger trauma patients, uh, you just don't use that type of implant, okay? Uh, locking plates have their own set of problems, which include articular penetration and um, uh, potentially cut out, um, but um, uh, they don't suffer quite as degree of problems as we had with the non-locked plates. So I'm going to pause here. We'll pick up in the next set of slides and we'll try to sort of sort out how you decide um, whether you need to operate or non-operate on patients. And unfortunately, there's some um, newer data that has muddied the decision making quite a bit that I think is worth mentioning. It's not in the slides, but I'm going to bring that up uh, just to confuse you a little bit more. Um, uh, so um, I'll stop there. Thanks.